myself, I'm kind of excited about this story and this, uh, you know, confluence between history and literature in the um, Nathaniel Hawthorne's uh, story, short story, um, The Maypole of Marymount, which he published in 19, 1837. And you can picture uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, um, you know, looking in the um, historical archives in the same way that Washington Irving did in writing his stories. Uh, where he writes in the curious history of the early settlement of Mount Wollaston or Marymount, um, there's, uh, you know, he says ample foundation for a ph philosophic romance. And, and what he means by that is uh, kind of like looking back in the past and uh, this was like, you know, a version of historical fiction um, from the time. But he says that, um, you know, the grave pages of our New England analysts, so not necessarily um, Bradford, whose manuscript was in England, I think, at this time, um, you know, waiting to be rediscovered, um, but, you know, other New England writers, and some of them had read, um, you know, historians who had read Bradford, uh, you know, that these uh, historical facts are sort of almost spontaneously become a sort of allegory, is what he, what he writes here. Um, and it, it's what I described in the previous video in the um, the competent the culture war between uh, the uh, the fundamentalists and the uh, and the ravers, right? Um, so this, if you have hypothesis, uh, if you're using it and can get into it, uh, there's a lot of an annotations here um, by my TA from a previous version of this course, Anthony Gomez, and they're really great. So I um, encourage you to check those out. I'll click on a couple of them for you. Um, so the story begins um, with that maypole. On Midsummer Eve, um, so Midsummer Eve. That's um, so not um, May Day uh, for Hawthorne, but um, the summer solstice, like you know, on June twenty something, when the um, uh, you know the longest day of the year. The venerated album. Um, okay, so. Um, and you know, so it's a description of that May power on the lowest green bough hung a wreath of wreath of roses and if you've read Hawthorne you might have some um, you know if you read the Scarlet Letter you might have some thoughts about that wreath of wreath of roses um, like the the rose bush in um, you know outside of Hester Prynne's uh, prison some had gathered um, in the sunniest spots of the poorest and others of still richer blush which the colony colonists had reared from English seed so it's kind of Hawthorne um, you know doing as Hawthorne does you know thinking about uh, this uh, f symbolism of these, um, uh, you know, English flowers versus, you know, American flowers. Okay, I can't get too into that um, because I don't know what I'm talking about. But here, uh, he, the narrator, um, you know, talks about like all these people in costume um, who are dressed up like, uh, you know, if you think about, uh, think about the poem um, from uh, New England Canaan, um, here the people are sort of uh, impersonating these mythological figures, um, fauns and nymphs. Um, it could not be that the fauns and nymphs, which were driven from their classic robes and homes of ancient fable, had sought refuge, as all the persecuted did in the fresh woods of the West. Uh, so this is an interesting line. It's hard not to think about um, the, them as kind of proxies for Native Americans who, you know, in Hawthorne's day, um, and think he's writing in the 1830s, this is you know, after and during Indian removal. Um, so, uh, you know, these people, including some who um, still a counterfeit, who were dressed up as Native Americans, um, were sort of partying in New England um, because at least these fawns and nymphs, um, these indigenous figures had been driven out of the woods um, of, of England. Uh, so this is in sense like, you know, feeding into, or, you know, the material that Hawthorne is spinning into an allegory. So, um, such were the colonies, columns of Mount uh, Marymount as they stood under in the broad smile of sunset around their venerated ma maple. Had a wanderer bewildered in the melancholy forest heard their mirth and stolen a half affrighted glance, he might have fancied that he saw the crew of Comus. Uh, you know, in other words, like you know, uh, mythological party people. Um, some already transformed to brutes, some midway between man and beast, and others rioting in the flow of tipsy jollity that foran the change. But a band of Puritans who watched the scene, invisible themselves, 
compared the masks to those devils and ruined souls with whom their superstition peopled the black wilderness. So, and you think about Young Goodman Brown and uh, Young Goodman Brown's perspective on, on that wilderness is like, you know, sort of filled with the devil's creatures. And that's what these uh, separatists are seeing and, uh, you know, and looking on at the party in um, Marymount. But here, uh, Hawthorne is taking, you know, you could say, like, if you think about that genre of historical fiction where you know, a writer takes uh, the, um, you know, takes this material from, uh, you know, fictional sources and, you know, builds a story into it with protagonists who may or may not actually be historical personages themselves. What Hawthorne is doing here is like kind of taking the story about the conflict between uh, Morton and the, um, you know, and the separatists, the Plymouth separatists, and, uh, you know, building a little bit of a narrative within it. Um, and that involves a young couple, the two areas forms that had ever trodden on any more solid footing, etc. One was a youth, in other words, like, you know, a young, you know, man who was um, dressed up, um, you know, as a reveler with this rainbow pattern. Um, he had a gilded staff, uh, th and think about the, um, the staff of the, the devil um, in Young Goodman Brown um, in one hand, and in the other, he had a fair maiden that was next to them. Um, so this beautiful couple is in the middle of the party, and um, they are the lord and lady of the May. So they're sort of like the people being celebrated um, and uh, actually joined together in marriage, um, through this ceremony. This wedlock was more serious than most other, most affairs of Marymount, where just and delusion, trick and fancy kept up a continual car carnival. And they have a little conversation with one another. Um, so here he says to her, his name is Edith, I mean, her name is Edith. Edith, sweet lady of the May, is yon wreath of roses a garland to hang above our graves that you look so sad? He's like, why do you look sad, Edith? Oh, Edith, this is our golden time, tarnish it not by any pensive shadow of the mind, for it may be that nothing of futurity will be brighter than the mere remembrance of what is now passing. So what he's saying to her is like, why are you sad? This should be the happiest moment of our lives. And she said, that's exactly why I'm so sad, because like, you know, everything's going to be downhill from here. So what this reminded me of, um, if any of you saw the Barbie movie, it's like, you know, the, um, you know, uh, obsessive thoughts of death Barbie or whatever she's called, you know, when they're having this big bar Barbie party and she says, like, do you ever think about dying? Did you guys see that? I'm sorry about the spoiler if you haven't. Um, but this is kind of like that. It's like, you know, here they are and, you know, where, you know, party every night, like everyone's supposed to be happy all the time. And she's thinking about mortality and so is he. And from that moment, um, because they actually like loved each other, e Edith and uh, the guy who, I, oh, Edgar, um, because they truly loved each other, they subjected themselves to earth's doom of care and sorrow and troubled joy and had no more a home at Marymount. So basically, like, you know, their love makes them recognize their mortality and they're kind of like Adam and Eve. And this is like, you know, they're Eden, uh, Marymount, but this is like in Paradise Lost when Adam and Eve like walk out of paradise together holding hands, right? That's um, Edgar and Edith in, the, in this scene. So they're still part of the party, but they're no longer part of Marymount um, because they have true love with one another, and that means being human. Does that sound right? Okay. Um, mirth um, was but the counter, you know, everyone's there partying, right? And, you know, the young people might actually think that this is like, you know, super fun and life is happy. Um, the elder spirits, like, you know, the older people there, they know better. Um, but they're still interest. They still determined to to party and pretend that they don't know better. Mirth was but the counterfeit of happiness. So that distinction between mirth and happiness is kind of key to the story too. Like you know, dressing in wild clothes, dancing, drinking, all of that is is kind of, um, you know, looking away from that, like how awful life is really. Okay. Um, yeah, and that we're all going to die. We're all doomed. That's kind of um, the vibe of the story. Um, but the Puritans, as, as Hawthorne calls it, kind of anachronistically, um, but, you know, thinking about these separatists, uh, the um, Christian separatists there on Marymount, 
can't stand it, right? They, they um, you know, this is an affront to their holiness. They might be singing a holy song, um, but the echo from which the forest sent back to them often seemed like the chorus of a jolly catch, in other words, like one of their um, party songs from Marymount, closing with a roar of laughter. Who but the fiend and his bond slaves, the crew of Marymount, had thus disturbed them? So there's something very, very wrong out there, and it's these, um, you know, partying Anglicans who, uh, you know, don't recognize that, um, you know, they don't recognize the idea of original sin and, um, you know, damnation and all of that stuff, right? So Hawthorne refers to, like, you know, these parts of the story as the authentic passages from history, but back to the nuptials of Lord and Lady of the May, which was his, like, little fiction within it. Alas, we have delayed too long and must darken our tales too suddenly. So this is the narrator talking, and what he's basically saying there is like, okay, um, you know, so, you know, back to the Barbie land or Barbie world, um, you know, analogy, like, you know, things are going to get awful pretty quickly right now. Um, as we glance at the uh, maypole, a solitary sunbeam is fading from the summit, and, uh, you, know, you know, the sun is going away, and at this point, the Puritans, um, as he calls them, kind of erupt into the... Um, uh, you know, into the party, and, and you know, it's like you know, the cops came, sirens blazing, time to like you know, time to run out. Um, the Puritan of Puritans, Endicott himself, just like um, uh, Bradford referred to, um, you know, Endicott he calls them in the. Um, but this is John Endicott, um, who's uh, sort of you know the the leader of this group um, that uh, you know breaks up the party and uh, persecutes them. Um, he actually chops down that maypole and, um, you know, then regrets chopping it down because if he, he could have used it as a whipping post, right? That's what he, that's what he says over here. Um, you know, so they're getting ready to punish everybody, um, including the Lord of Misrule, uh, Morton himself, who's dressed up as kind of like the high priest here. Um, you know, but then there's this young couple and you know, he um, sets about punishing them too, you know, he's going to give everybody a beating. But the May Lord, Edgar, says, how can I move thee? I would resist to the death, but since I have no power, I entreat or I, you know, plead with you, beg you, do with me as thou wilt, but let Edith go untouched. So she sa he says, like, you know, beat me up, kill me, whatever, but don't hurt my lover, um, Edith, or my wife. And she says the same thing, right? be at death and lay it all on me and not on him. So they've demonstrated their true love to him and that actually softens Endicott's view a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, so they cut off his hair. Um, he had a love lock like this. This is like the partying Anglican dude. Um, and this is my favorite part. He says, crop it forthwith. Um, that, um, and in that, uh, in the true pumpkin shell fa fashion, so it gives him a Puritan haircut. There we go. Do you see that little thing. I don't know how it's going to come out well in the video. Okay, thanks, Anthony, for that. Then bring them, them along with us, but more gently than their fellows. So out of all of the partying crew, he sort of, um, you know, accepts the, um, this young couple who feel true love for one another um, as, a, you know, sort of future members of their community. Nor think ye, young ones, that they are the happiest, even in our lifetime of a moment, who misspend it in dancing around a maypole. So the uh, the conclusion of the story, Endicott is saying like, you know, you think that was happiness, that wasn't happiness. We're only on earth for a moment, um, you know, against eternity. And, you know, all of these other revelers that are, um, uh, you know, going to be damned um, uh, or suffer eternal damnation, so they'll be in hell forever. Um, but, you know, you have a chance. And I'll just read the last paragraph. It's a typical Hawthorne bummer, right? And Endicott, the severest Puritan of all, who laid the rock foundation of New England, lifted the wreath of roses from the ruin of the maypole and threw it with his own gauntleted hand over the heads of the Lord and Lady of the May. It was a deed of prophecy. As the moral gloom of the world overpowers all systematic um, gaiety, even so was their home of wild mirth made desolate amid the sad forest. In other words, like sadness and gloom take over everything. Um, because that's that's uh, mortal life. They returned to it no more, but as their flower garland was wreathed of the brightest roses that had grown there, 
so in the tie that united them were intertwined all the purest and best of their early joys. They went heavenward, supporting each other along the difficult path which it was their, their lot to tread, and never wasted one regretful thought on the vanities of Marymount. So it seems like Hawthorne is saying here at the end that, you know, this couple is really sort of like the hope for futurity. You know, the Puritans are horrible. The um, the uh, revelers on Mount um, on Mary Mount are um, are doomed. Um, but you know, I guess like taking life seriously and loving one another at least is a way forward. All right. Um, hope you um, hope you like the story and my mini lecture, somewhat.